My wife Teal and I have presented many classes on various topics of game development. This creator classroom ties them together as we tackle the best practices of how to make a game. Hopefully this video helps guide you along your journey. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone, I'm Steel. And I'm Teal. And we're with Studio Blue. Thank you for joining us for our Creator Classroom. Tonight's topic is creating a video game and we will be doing a deep dive into best practices in game development. Hello RPG Emma and anyone else who's watching us. If you're checking us out live on Twitch, please give us a follow and consider subscribing. And if you're checking us out VOD on YouTube, please smash that like button, click subscribe, jingle the notification bell with all that love and leave a comment. Let us know what you think of this particular classroom. Now, as Teal said, the name of this one is creating a video game, but we call it that this one kind of came in at a request. Someone wanted how to create an RPG game, and as we were putting this classroom together, we realized we can probably just turn it into a game development overview anyway. And this is, like Teal said, a deep dive. Yes, it is. So because we have a lot of information to present. A lot. Uh, this is going to be the structure of tonight's classroom. Yep. I'm going to present to you the information on each slide. And then Steel will have a chance to give his thoughts and insights and comments on it. As well as we will also be uh, addressing the, the questions and comments from chat. Yep. After I've uh, de delivered the slide. Uh, once we have addressed most of the questions and comments, we'll move on to the next slide. Absolutely. And of course, at the end, we'll also have a Q&A session. So if you want to hold your questions to the end, that's fine too. Now, one of the important things is that the concept of game development is extremely expansive. There is so much that goes into it. And a lot of times in this particular classroom, we're going to either reference classrooms that we've already done, or we're going to reference classrooms that we are going to do. So in many ways, this is kind of uh, the the one that brings everything together eventually. Right. So don't be like, we're not trying to skimp anything. It's just, it's well beyond the scope of one classroom to teach game development. So this is just our best practices. Just kind of a top-down view. Yes. Okay. So you want to get started? Let's do it. Too. All right. So the purpose of tonight's classroom is to showcase the best methodology for creating a video game whether it's solo or with a team, using the general breakdown used by the industry. For this classroom, we will be focusing on RPG creation, as our community consists mainly of RPG developers. However, these steps could be applied to any genre. This entire classroom is a broad overview of the process. Other classrooms will go more in depth into such things as characters, worlds, and story arcs. Exactly. So one of the big things that we're going to be doing is in the uh, the description for the YouTube video, we're going to make sure to link our previous creator classrooms that are on this topic. Yes. Um, because this is, like I said, just such a massive broad scale. So, uh, you know, the, here's the broad. Now we're going to bring in down to the narrow with our other classrooms. Right. Let's do this thing. Let's go. All right. All right, here, here, let's talk about the overview, the stages of game development. Hello, Chaos. Hey, Chaos. Welcome to the stream. I saw your message earlier, by the way. Um, it's it's on our uh, it, it's on our, our um, go to YouTube and search for RPG Maker Web and find them there or on our Discord or it'll be our placard on our Twitch channel when we're streaming there. Yes, that's the way to describe it. Hello. And human has arrived. Human. All right. Sorry for interrupting. Teal, go for no, it. No, you're fine. You're fine. And there's Vero. Yeah, oh my gosh, Vero. Let, let's let some people populate the, the yeah, chat. Let's do that for a second. Before let's we dive right into this. Give the slime a chance to show off. You know, he's he's just chilling right now. He's doing his uh there you go. He's gonna click that subscribe button. There oh, I goes. love it. He there's it. our slime. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> he just wants to make sure that, you know, everyone is uh clicking like, clicking subscribe, and uh, you know, following us for great yeah. content. <laughs> All right, let's do this. So thing. just to, to uh, mm -hmm. briefly review, right. for those of you who just joined us, yes. uh, because there's so much information to give, 
Right. Uh, I'm going to relate to you the information on each slide. Yes. In its entirety, then Steele will give his thoughts on the right on the the issues, and we will be a manning chat, and yes. we will address your questions and comments after that for each slide. Right. So okay. if you say something on chat and we don't immediately respond like we usually do, it's just because this is a deep dive with so much info. Right. But we will address your questions and comments and uh, we'll move on when things taper off a bit for each slide. Of course, at the end of the classroom, we'll also have a chance for Q&A. So if you yes. want to hold your question to the end, that's OK, too. And thank you so much, Vero. That is an amazing compliment. <laughs> that is really a kind thing to say. Yeah, uh, also for those of you who are just joining us, this is the broad overview of game development and a lot of our other classrooms fill in the blanks. All right, Teal, go for it. Here we go, stages of game development. First, there is the pre-alpha, which is the conceptualization of the game, as well as its creation on paper. Creation of your game design document, or GDD, is a major part of this phase. Please note that in the industry, there are several stages that work prior to or in tandem with the stage, such as proof of concept or the vertical slice. Those, however, are beyond this classroom. Next, there is the alpha stage. During this stage, you create your entire game from start to finish with all of your features and systems. Any story in the game is bare bones and the assets can be placeholders. Then there's the beta stage, which is the addition of all the refined writing, assets, themes, etc. The game will be ready for balancing and bug testing at the end of this phase. Finally, there is the gold stage, where the game is ready for publishing. In the industry, there is also sometimes a silver phase, which acts as a transition from beta to gold. But that's not necessarily the norm in traditional game development theory. Exactly. It really just depends um, where you are and what you're doing. Silver is also used a lot for early access or open betas, etc. Where the game is finished, not finished. But uh, the big thing to call in is the whole pre-alpha. Pre-alpha is basically your planning, conceptualizing, and like Teal said, putting that game on paper. Um, we don't often talk about the GDD because a lot of your single developers don't necessarily have a need for it as much as teams. But the GDD is one of the most important things for working in a team environment, especially a large environment. That will be a classroom one day, but it will be a very methodical classroom. Um, but that's really it. Uh, honestly, this is it's, it's what you see is what you get on screen. Yeah. Yeah. If there's any questions, please feel free to toss them out while Teal is talking, because if we don't see anything in chat, we'll just move we right will on. move on. Let's do it. All right, let's do a deep dive into the various stages. All right. All right. First, the pre-alpha stage. Yeah. This is where you conceptualize and create your game on paper. You should have your story concept decided before moving into the actual pre-alpha stage. You should not be working in the engine during this portion outside of learning how the engine works. You may not even have an engine yet, and that's okay. Concentrate on deciding what you want and don't want in this stage, but it is okay if you change things during the upcoming alpha stage. Now, one of the important things to notice is earlier we talked about proof of concept and vertical slice, and that kind of contradicts what's on this slide. The proof of concept is, hey, here's a game I can make, and here's the idea of what the game is going to look like in its most bare bones. Like, um, we could use a proof of concept of a guy walking around hitting his stuff with a sword. Okay, so I can make that. Uh, the vertical slice is kind of like your elevator pitch. It's a very brief thing that a person could play who you want to go to for funding to show you what you want the game to look like. In both of those situations, it's more than just paper. You're obviously working in the engine. And that kind of does contradict what we just said. But we're talking about the planning and concept stage of pre-alpha, not the stage where you're putting together, you know, hey, here's how I work in an engine. Here's how the engine could look. Here's how the game could look. Please give me money. That's outside of the scope of this. This is just yeah. the planning part of pre-alpha. All right. Ready to move on? Yes. Let's let's do a deep dive into pre-alpha stage. Pre-alpha it is. Scope. Scope is defined as the overall area of influence of your game. Does your game span a single location, a region, a country, an entire continent, 
The entire world or multiple worlds. Changing scope once the game is under main development in the alpha stage can be pretty dangerous because it could result in massive story overhauls as well as considerable increases in time and cost. Choose the scope that works for your story concept instead of changing your story concept to work with your scope. Exactly. Uh, this is That along with story concept are two things that people seem to think are fluid. No, your story itself can be fluid. Your side stories, your character arcs, your main quests, your side quests, etc., etc. What we're talking about is the very core of what your game is. And the scope is where, what that encompasses. So, for example, if you're going to make a Legend of Zelda game, the story of, uh, let's just talk about uh, Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time. The main story concept is uh, Link goes back and forth between the past and the future in order to stop Ganon and rescue Zelda. That's like the most, you know, basic concept. And then the scope is Hyrule. You know, the kingdom of Hyrule and the surrounding areas. Right. Changing those once you're deep in development can cause a ton of problems. It can make it, you have more resources you didn't need, less resources, you know, uh, you may have to change engines because your oh, engine's not optimized for it. Yeah. I want to add in a bunch of flying stages, stuff like that. Those are things you got to watch out for. Chaos says, so what point does a story, go so have one point that the story goes along. Yeah, have an idea of the story. The concept is the story you're trying to tell, the basic high level of what your story is. The scope is what that encompasses. The area, physical or mental or emotional, does it encompass one person's dreams, that kind of thing. Figure out those two pieces and then stick with them as much as humanly possible because it's a lot of work and dangerous to try to change that. Hope that answers your question there, Chaos. We have any other questions? Yeah. Otherwise, we'll move on whenever you're ready, honey. Yeah, give them a okay. second. Yeah, I just want to give them a quick. second yeah, yeah, in yeah, case yeah. somebody has a question. Right. All right, we'll move on. Okay, let's move on. All right, the main story. With the story concept and your scope decided, now you create your main story. Mm -hmm. This is defined as the main action of your game, from the time the player starts a new game to when the final credits roll. You don't have to define a post credit scene now unless you really want to. Right. This main story does not include any side stories that don't immediately move the main narrative forward. An example of a side story that does this is the urn of sacred ashes being needed for Arl Aemon in Dragon Age Origins. Technically, this is a side tangent that is needed to advance the main quest. You can indeed create these now. Right, so the important thing to do when you're creating your main story, aka main quest, because we're taking this from an RPG standpoint, <clears throat> is don't include your side content. Don't include your side quests. Don't include your side stories. Don't include your character arcs of anything that doesn't deal directly with the main action. Um, only if it relates to the main action, like in this case, the Urn of Sacred Ashes, would you put it in. You're going to want to do that because you want to have a well-strong definition of your main story. Hello, Shredstein. Welcome to the stream. Good to see you. Oh, got a follow. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, Snap. Yes, thank you so much for the follow. Much appreciated. Um, so keep that in mind. You want to have the main action right out. So this is where you're writing it out. And you can write it out as a story, a bunch of outline points. Um, however you feel is the best way to organize your ideas. But you want to get it from the moment that a new game starts to the final credit. Roll credits. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Is this Unreal or Unity? This is for anything, Shred. Anything. Yeah. The, the engine is irrelevant for, for this particular classroom. Right. We are talking about the high-level overview of game development, and we'll be touching uh, on certain topics and actually referencing our other classrooms. RPGMA says, what if you want to make a game where you keep updating the main story with new things after the game is out? Th then you, what you want to do, RPGMA, is you want to get to where the not the first thing without the first update is. So let's just say for the sake of saying that you defeat the quote unquote final boss, but then there's a lot more that comes after it. Uh, Dragon Age Inquisition is a great example. Uh, it ends with the Battle of Corypheus, where you destroy Corypheus. Corypheus Pit. Yeah, Corypheus Pit. But there's still extra content, including Trespasser. So this would be writing the story from the moment that the um, explosion happens at the Conclave, the Enclave, 
all the way to the death of Coriferous. That's this that we're talking about. The additional content you would write in afterwards, because that's considered to be side content, because that's not the main action of the main story. Chaos says, so have it round back to the main point in the story. Yeah, what you want to do is you want to have this be the, the main story of your game. Yeah, this main Best story. Mm -hmm. DLB people can multitask, do programming and art. Yes, we do, Shred. Um, people can absolutely do multiple things. In fact, to be a solo developer, and that's a little bit off topic, but to be a solo developer, you actually have to do a number of things simultaneously. You have to be good at art, look at programming, understand at least how music sounds, mm -hmm. uh, mapping. So, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Okay, if there's no other questions, we'll move on. Uh, otherwise, we'll answer questions. Let's see this real quick. All right, move on, Teal. Okay, let's move on. Moving on. All right. The protagonist. You should develop this along with the main story. Your protagonist is your main character, the person who the player follows for most of the game's main action. They don't have to be a good person, just relatable. You can stay with the protagonist all of the time, such as in most RPGs. You can switch away from protagonists for some lengths of time, such as switching from Squall to Laguna in Final Fantasy VIII, or even kill the protagonist and replace them with another, such as with Chrono in Chrono Trigger. Whoever your protagonist is, they must have both a strong motivation in the main story, as well as the highest stakes. So to answer the questions here on chat very quickly. <clears throat> Chaos, how can I tell if I go off topic? If I either go away from what's on the slide or if Teal looks at me funny, then I'll know I've gone off topic. Yeah. Um, and Shred, uh, we are developers. I wouldn't say we're full time right now because we spend a lot more time working on online content. But my wife and I have been game devving since like 2002, 2003. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little about the protagonist. Um, a lot of people think the protagonist is the hero. And that's not always the case. Right. The protagonist is who the player plays as, or otherwise known as the player avatar. It is the quote-unquote main character. They don't have to be the hero, they don't have to be the good guy, they just have to be, that's the person you play. Um, Earl Koya says, "What? oh, there is a main character in FF6. Uh, it is Tara Branford. Bradford? Branford? Tara Bradford, is technically the main character. However, however, you are correct that the game has such a diverse cast that you can absolutely spread that amongst multiple people. And in many ways, you could say that the protagonist of FF6 is the player swapping between people. That mm -hmm. we are the main character. Um, when you do that, when you have your cast of thousands, you still have a protagonist. It's just who do you have a protagonist at that moment? So Song of Ice and Fire is a perfect example of that. Um, there are multiple chapters where you are like Bran, or your uh, Sansa, or your Ira, or your any of the other Starks before they get killed. When you are in that person's chapter, that person is the protagonist. So a lot of people think that a main character is just the one character. It's the protagonist is who you play. And as long as you're playing them in that bulk of time where they're the main action, they're the protagonist. Mm -hmm. So, a really good example outside of, you know, in video games, um, you are playing Squall as the protagonist of the main story. Laguna's story, he is the protagonist of the flashbacks. So in both of those occasions, those are your protags. Yeah. So hopefully that answers all. I kind of jumped around a little bit. My apologies. And welcome to the stream, by the way. It's good seeing you in the RPG Maker stream earlier. Um, okay. Ready to move? If anyone's, oh, here we go. Yep. Shred says, I want to make a video game with a happy ending, like many of house movies. Are there any games out like There's a lot of games with happy endings. Oh, without a happy ending. I misread. Uh, yeah, you can have tons of games without happy endings. In fact, some game, some of the best games in the world are the ones with a deep emotional impact because they don't necessarily end well. Yeah. Um, Bioshock Infinite. That game is extremely sad and very dark in its ending, but it's a beautiful story. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. 150% right there. Um, okay. Moving on. Let's move on. All right, the primary antagonist. You should develop this along with your main story. Your primary antagonist is the one who directly opposes the protagonist, acting as a narrative obstacle between the protagonist and their goal. The primary antagonist doesn't have to be an evil person, just understandable. Unless, of course, they are pure evil. This does not mean sympathetic, 
but the player must come to understand why they are doing what they are doing. Your antagonist's goal is to be exactly the opposite from the protagonist's. So to kind of jump back to what Earl said, because Earl brought up one of my favorite games that is mm -hmm. great for game development dissection, Final Fantasy VI. There is a, a primary antagonist in the first half of the game, which is General Gestahl, and that switches to the true primary antagonist, which is uh, Kefka. Mm -hmm. And Kefka is built up as being a, a horrible person for the entire game, and then when he quote-unquote heel turns, he doesn't mean super evil turns, kills Gestahl and destroys the world, even though it's a huge shock, it's not a surprise that he would do something like that. It's totally in character. Totally in character. And we're actually going to hit up that on a future slide on this, this particular classroom. But you want your primary antagonist, and here's the important thing. It doesn't have to be the bad guy. The primary antagonist. Oh, thank you so much for the follow, Shred. That is super awesome of you. Thank you. The, um, the primary antagonist's goal is opposite of the protagonist. That final point right there is the big one. Whatever goal your protagonist has, your antagonist's goal has to be the other thing, the opposite, the the polar opposite, even if it includes stopping the protagonist. Ah, Asunax is following us. Thank, Thank you. you. Super awesome. So, yeah, you can absolutely have games where your protagonist switches. I mean, sorry, your antagonist switches. Yeah, they can switch. You know, so it's just whoever the protagonist is at that moment, the person who is directly opposed to their goals is your primary antagonist. Yes. That's what you gotta remember. So let me go. Earl says, who do you think the main antagonist is in FF10? Seymour seems like Yuna, Jet for Titus. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So again, in the Titus storyline, as Titus is the protagonist, Jet is the antagonist. Yes. 100%, it's son overcoming his basically abusive father. Um, Yu Yevin is the primary antagonist to Spira. To Spira, that's right. right. And Seymour is the primary antagonist to Yuna. So yes, absolutely great point, Earl, by the way. Um, that's kind of how it works. Chaos says, so like the Pokemon games. I believe I know what you're talking about. Yes, the, the antagonist shifts depending on who the protagonist is, and that's always the case. Does the player have to be the protagonist? What about games where the player customizes their character and helps the character in the game? You're still the protagonist, Emma. Like, um... You don't have to be the hero to be the protagonist. That horrible game, White Knight Chronicles. The player avatar that you create is the protagonist because you're playing them, but the hero is Leonard. Right. And one of the reasons why that game doesn't work so well is that it makes the protagonist, your player avatar, feel like a scrub. Yeah. And that's what happens when you don't do it right. <laughs> the player <laughs> feels like a scrub. Yeah. Um, but the player-controlled avatar is the protagonist. Not necessarily the hero, the protagonist. Right. So when you're creating your pre-alpha, when you're creating all of this stuff, keep in mind who the protagonist is because that's who the player is controlling. You'll get to the hero of the story if it's another character when we get to the, the side characters later on. Okay. okay. Let's move on. Let's move on. Good questions, by the way, everyone. These are really good questions. Yes. Okay. Side stories. These should be developed directly after the main story, but elements of these can be conceptualized during that part. Just don't focus on the creation of side stories until after the main story is complete. Side stories should add something to either the main story, one of the characters, or the world itself. They should primarily consist of story arcs for the supporting characters that don't have to be completed to finish the game. They also don't have to be side quests. If a side story doesn't add anything, you should consider cutting it. Try to avoid side stories that are just fetch quests, kill quests, etc. The number of side stories should take your scope and main story into consideration. Games like the Atelier series thrive on side stories to make up the bulk of their game, while games like Persona 5 only have a few of them. Side quests are called requests. Right, the mementos requests. <laughs> so uh, before we, before I talk about the side stories, to address Shred's question, what about making characters very gray? Um, that's fine. It's if you're controlling the the actual term in the industry um, is player avatar. That's who the player controls. 
So that's Titus in FF9, that's Sora in Kingdom Hearts, that's the Atelier characters like Sophie and Atelier Sophie. The actual term is Avatar, player Avatar. But because games have become, especially RPGs, more story-like, more mm -hmm. story-centric, we, it's okay to call them protagonists. That's mm -hmm. technically a book writing term, but you can call them protagonists for the sake of argument. So in your case, Shred, you're talking about a character that's very great, like uh, some of the assassin characters in mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed, like Altair. That's a protagonist. You don't have to be the good guy. Um, Legacy of Cain, your vampire Cain, is a horrible person, and yet he's the protagonist because you play him. Yeah. All right, yep. so... The side story is a big thing Teal brought up that I feel is most relevant to the RPG crowd out there is that um, they don't have to be side quests. They can be entire storylines that have full and complete starts, middles, plot twists, branching paths, and ends. Uh, like a lot of the quest lines in the Elder Scrolls series, like Dark Brotherhood, College of Winterhold Companions. Those are side stories. Yeah, they they are. don't have to just be side quests. Um, so when you are developing your game, especially if it's an RPG, anytime a story from start to finish either intersects, runs parallel, or even branches away and then comes back when it's over with the main quest, it's a side story. Um, Chaos says, what examples can you give of a good and bad side quest? Oh, heavens. Um, okay, so you're talking about side quests and not side stories. Um, some of the really good side quests that I like, I love the Mementos quests in, the Mementos requests in Persona 5. Uh, some of them are necessary in order to uh, bring a rank up with your confidants. Right. They are very, very good because you find out that a person has done a horrible thing and is a bad person. You go into Mementos, find their shadow, fight their shadow, defeat their shadow, and change that person's heart so they are no longer a terrible person. Right. That is an amazing side quest. Because I feel like it not only um, gives us, you know, a, a piece of the world, but it, it it expands the world. It makes the world that we're in larger and feel mm -hmm. more real than just our phantom thieves going around and stealing treasures. Right. So that's a good side quest. A bad side quest, um, I have a real problem personally with job boards. Ooh. Like a huge issue with them. Um, I'm not saying that they don't have their place and I'm not saying don't use them. But I'm saying use them with caution because when you use them incorrectly, it's basically just a glorified fetch quest. Mm -hmm. Now, there are players who want to do that. There are players who want to grab a thing on a piece of paper and says, go get 20 furs. Okay, that's fine. However, that needs to be superfluous side content that you're putting in there so that players initiate it as filler when they want to just go around, explore your open world, and collect furs. Right. So that's not a bad side quest, but that's something Steel has an issue with. Um, a really bad side quest. Teal, what can you think of a side quest that you absolutely hated? Um, in uh, Dragon Warrior, uh, dra um, excuse me, what is it? Uh, Dragon Empires? Dra oh, Dynasty Warriors Dynasty Empire. Warriors Empires. Yes. There was this this annoying escort quest. You yes. have to rescue this this character called Ding Dong. That's what we called her. And she's always getting in trouble. You know, help, help, come rescue me in the middle of a bunch of armies. So you had to go... Cross the field, battle all these armies. Go grab this dumb little sprite and then um, escort her to one of the exits. Escort missions. Oh are my usually, god! Uh, you usually want to stay away from escort missions anyway, but and, and yeah. it happened in the middle of of a campaign of fighting, right. so it was really a distraction. Right. So those are quests. Now, if you're talking about side stories, yes, you want your side stories to have a point and. Honestly, if you can have your side stories, every single one, intersect, run parallel, and then return to the main story in some fashion, even if it, what it does is it gives people involved in that side story closure and momentum to move forward with your main narrative, that's a word salad, but that's accurate, um, then it's a good side story. Yeah. Um, have your characters, like, your character goes on a side story, he helps a friend, this friend learns and grows and becomes a person, and the intersects back in the main story and may or may not travel with you, but at the very least, hey, maybe they've set up shop in town and now mm -hmm. they can sell you more goods. Right. You know, or he's he's going to go brave new lands and you meet him in a later chapter. Things like that. Intersect. Mm -hmm. Intersect. Yeah. All right. Do so, it. yeah, let's, let's move, move on, on to yeah. supporting characters. Oh, yeah. You should develop these along with the side stories. Please do. These are your dirtagonists and tritagonists. 
along with other important non-playable characters. Every one of them should have the same level of development as the protagonist. Yes. Don't create flat characters. Please. They can be allies or neutral to the protagonist. Your quest givers should all be in here as well. Hence why you create these along with the side stories. This does not include basic NPCs such as townspeople or random characters. You can create these now up to and including in the beta stage. So um, there's a slight contradiction on this slide, but that was on purpose simply because of the fact that we're gearing this a little more towards RPG creators. Um, we say this can include your quest givers, and we just made a huge point of how it's side stories and not side quests. The fact of the matter is when you're an RPG developer, you're going to think in terms of side quests. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give your quest givers that same amount of love and development that you have all your other characters, which you should, you want to create your quest givers along with your other supporting cast. Um, Chaos says, what support line can we use so the supporting characters can be not flat? Do the exact same thing, Chaos, that you would with your protagonist and antagonist. Create them all the same way. We have a creator classroom on creating sympathetic characters. That'll be one of the things we link. Um, use that. Follow those guidelines. You can make your characters very sympathetic, even if it's just some person you meet on the road selling pots. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay, are you ready to move on to? Yeah, let's move on okay. to secondary antagonists. Burr, 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 burr. You should develop these along with the side stories. These are characters who serve as an antagonizing force to the protagonist, but aren't the main antithesis of the story. These characters can work with the primary antagonist, they can work independently of them, or directly oppose them. They can eventually join with the protagonist, such as Hendrik becoming a hero in Dragon Quest XI, or assist the protagonist temporarily when it suits, such as Frieza from Dragon Ball Z. Secondary antagonists can supplant the primary antagonist if you wish, such as when Kefka kills Emperor Gestal in Final Fantasy VI. So, a couple of things to note here. Um, first, that word antithesis. Just so no one's lost, that's what we went over in our character dev creator classroom, so I am kind of calling back to that. Um, this is going into thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, and I'll give a very, very quick reminder. Thesis is what I am attempting to accomplish. Antithesis is the opposite of that that will try to stop me. Synthesis is the result of that conflict, and that is a massive overview, that is a massive simplification. <laughs> but for example, it would be like the hero's thesis is I'm going to stop the bad guy from, no. the thesis of the hero is I'm going to save the world. The villain's antithesis is I'm going to destroy the world. The synthesis is they fight and somebody wins and the other person dies. That's yeah, that's very, very, sim very simplistic. Very yes. simplistic. Um, all of your secondary antagonists can be some of your best characters. Uh, in fact, a lot of the times in a lot of the games that Teal and I have played over the years, mm -hmm. the secondary and antagonists are far more interesting. Final Fantasy VII Remake. Yeah. Um, Hojo. Hojo. Holy shit. Don Corneo. Oh, Don Corneo is a good example uh, of a secondary antagonist. President Shinra. Mm -hmm. All of those were amazing. Now, having said that, President Shinra was the primary antagonist until Sephiroth supplants him. Right. So, you see where we're going with this. Your secondary antagonist can be just as interesting, if not more, than your primaries. Uh, Goro, uh, uh <laughs> actually we haven't gotten that far, so all we know right now is that Akechi is, um, he's a punk where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, we just finished, um, we just got all of our members of Phantom Thieves. <laughs> so, yeah, no spoilers. But yes, Akechi is a fantastic secondary antagonist. Mm -hmm. He is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, what is the right way to use a secondary antagonist? The secondary antagonist should be what the primary antagonist cannot be because they're one person. Um, case in point. Um, my goodness gracious. The sentinel, the sinister sentinels in Dragon Quest XI. Those are the arms and legs of uh, Mordigan. Yeah. Uh, the fiends in Final Fantasy IV. They were Golbez's lackeys. They don't have to be minions, though. Um... Trying to think of a good secondary antagonist off the top of my head. Uh, General Leo was a secondary antagonist until he turned good. And he was to show that the Empire wasn't all completely evil, it was just Gestalt. So, the, use a secondary antagonist where you can't use the primary antagonist. 
to continue to flush out obstacles against the hero and the hero's groups. Yeah. I had a good example in the Castlevania anime. Oh, go for it. Go yeah. for it. Um, you know, the primary antagonist, of course, is, is Dracula, right? Right. But the secondary antagonist would be his uh, generals underneath him. Right. The uh, his um, the guys who create the monsters. Yeah, the guy who creates the monsters. That's the secondary antagonist. Right, and they were really good. In fact, where we're at now with the series, uh, they have an amazing story. So Earl asks a fantastic question. Wouldn't Golbez be the secondary antagonist as opposed to Zimus? Zimus shows up at the end of the game. For most of the game, the primary antagonist is actually Golbez. Yes, Zimus is the real bad guy. He's the mastermind. And when Golbez becomes good, thanks to Fushoya, uh, Fushuya, uh, Zimus becomes the primary antagonist. So all of this that we're talking about, keep in mind, you're never stuck on one protagonist always being the protagonist. You're right. never stuck on the primary antagonist always being. It can move around on what the player sees and how the player experiences the game. Yeah. Um, uh, Vero, you're right. Forge Master. That's what I was trying to think of. Thank you. The Forge Masters. Yes. Yes. Which are amazing characters. Very amazing. Um, so, yeah. So, at the beginning of the game, Golbez is the primary antagonist, with the Fiends and Cain being his secondaries. Um, and all the other stuff that you fight that tries to kill your ass is all secondary antagonists. When you get the switch and Golbez is revealed to be Cecil's brother, spoiler alert, Golbez becomes a good guy. He changes over to the good guy side, and Zimus becomes the primary antagonist. Yeah. Writing is fun. Ooh, I love writing. <laughs> Shall we move Let's on? Let's move on Please. to story progression. Oh. <clears throat> now you want to plot out how your story will progress. One section called a milestone at a time. Mm -hmm. You can split your story into chapters if that helps, even if you don't notify the player of those chapters. Understanding your story beats is important. A story beat is when you release story information. This should primarily come out through dialogue, cinematics, and the environment. Avoid information dumps, even through characters, whenever possible. And always avoid walls of text. It only works in very certain situations, such as the opening to Star Wars. <laughs> Pacing is key. Do not overload or understate your story. This slide right here is an entire creator classroom. Yes, it is. We will one day do story progression including milestones, story beats, etc., etc. But this is, you want to talk about a high-level overview of story creation and game development, this is as high-level as you get, because there are entire classes and people can spend years learning this. As an author, I spent most of my be the beginning of my career, the, about the first four or five years, really learning how this works. Yeah. Because this is slow, but once you master it, people will always feel your story. You'll constantly be giving them some sort of emotion to react to, some investment to feel. Um, so if this is a little overwhelming right here, this one slide, don't worry, we will eventually go over it. Exactly, the three-act structure, Hero's Journey, you are on point tonight, Earl, 100%. Yeah. That's it. So there will be a creator classroom in the future specifically on story progression because it's well beyond the scope of putting it just in a slide. Yeah. All right, shall we continue? Okay, let's move on. All right. Raising the stakes. You want your opening stakes to start off small enough to just encompass the protagonist and any supporting characters nearby. Start your game with a small circle of risk, then expand it bit by bit until it's equal to your scope. Follow your story progression. Raising the stakes too much too early can overwhelm the player while doing it too little too late cannot be enough, blindsiding them with your information. A good measurement is to widen the circle of risk with each major story milestone, having it at the largest just before the climax. This is shown well in Final Fantasy VI, where the second half of the game is about the heroes overthrowing the mad god Kefka, only to discover that just before the final battle, that his true goal is the complete destruction of the world. So again, we talk about stakes, we talk about stake characters in other creator classrooms. Um, 
And by the way, what we're, what we're giving right here is information, as advice, is literally just our take on it. There are tons of ways you can go about doing this. Uh, but we've always felt that the best way to do it, our preferred method is to start off with a small enough circle so that the player can acclimate themselves to the protagonist, their risks, their stakes, what it is they have to accomplish in order to stop a bad thing, and then slowly widen it more and more and more with those milestones and those story sections until it's as big as it's going to be. Um, if you jump a person, if you drop a person into a game and the first thing they hear is the world's going to end and only you can stop them, it can get overwhelming really fast and there can become a disconnect. There are times that it can work, but it's few and far between. Um, even the Luminary in Dragon Quest XI was more just basically given that hero's journey, you know, mm -hmm. told, hey, you're a hero, go do a hero thing. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, we're, okay, uh, <clears throat> jump over to Earl and I'll jump back to myself. Sometimes world ending stakes don't feel as real as more personal stakes. Save her or save the world. Even though the girl's part of the world, she feels more like more real than the world. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's no way, or, yes. The only reason Final Fantasy VI works is because they build it up piece at a time, brick by brick, literally story by story, until you come to the realization that this world that you're in is the summation of everyone's experiences, mm -hmm. their hopes, their fears, their fights against despair. Then you go face Kefka, and Kefka says, I'm going to destroy everything, and that's where the stakes go to save the world. Yeah. Um, the way they accomplished it in Final Fantasy VII was having a giant rock fall from the sky mm -hmm. that was going to blow the world up. So if yeah. you want to destroy the world, have it be something that the player can grasp onto, that the player can feel is real. Otherwise, what, what Earl said is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, Chaos says, so a stake can be if the main character got tricked. Yeah, the stake could be, um, so something like that would be, okay, so I'm the main character and the bad guy tricked me and I ended up hurting someone I love. Yeah. Now the stake is I have to fix this or that person will either die or never hate or hate me and never love me again. Right. You know, you want you want every character in the game, especially your protagonists, your protagonist, mm -hmm. to uh, have a stake, and that stake needs to get bigger and bigger. And now I want stake. <laughs> but yeah. So if anyone has any other questions about stakes, this also itself could be its own creator classroom, but we go over it a lot in our character dev and story arc classrooms. Yeah. Go over that a lot in those two. Yeah. Let me know if you're ready to move on, honey. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. let's, uh, let's move on. Yeah. And if, if you want to ask a question about a slide we've already passed, please do. We'll, we'll address them. Here we go. Ready? Okay. Now, we define player choice. With the main story and story progression created, you should now decide what effect the player's choices will have on it. You can give the player's choice a lot of weight, where what they say can alter the course of the story or the world, such as Dragon Age Inquisition. You can give the player's choice some amount of weight, where what they decide influences things on a smaller scale, such as in Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, Empire, or Stormcloaks. <laughs> you can give the player's choice no weight at all, creating the illusion of choice just so the player feels that they can interact such as Dragon Quest XI. For the last one, it can be insulting to the player if they are made to feel that they are offered choices that never, ever matter. Please consider not doing that. So the only reason that Dragon Quest XI does not get roasted by Teal and I continuously for the yes-no choices for the Luminary is because it's actually a joke. Yeah, it is. You have to choose yes, and if you choose no, literally something stupid happens. Like Ferris slamming his face in the dirt or Jade kicking you in the head. And then you go back to the to the question and you have to choose yes. Right. Or you're just on a continuous dum dum loop. Right. In that case, there actually is no choice. It's yeah. just do you want to laugh or do you want to move on with the story? Yeah, it's ex exactly what Vero just said. Mm -hmm. You expect the funny moment, not the outcome. In this case, DQ11 is 100% fine. What's not okay is when you give two clear choices and you f and no matter what happens, it goes right back into the main thing. Um, some of the times, Persona 5 actually sends that way a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, although we have been told that the choices you make do matter, so we're going to hold judgment on that. Uh, but DQ11 is the way to do it if you want to give no choice, but you still have to pick something. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, Emma says, if you say, like if you say something mean, you get an immediate enemy, so if you say something nice, you make friends. Exactly. Or here's a thing too, we can take that down a notch, Emma, uh, but still go off of that concept. You say something mean and the person around you doesn't respond negatively immediately, but then later on they were like, hey, you've been a dick to me lately, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then uh, if you say something nice, it's less. Uh, Earl says, uh, the first one takes a lot more development time though. Like you can accidentally let important characters die. New branch of the story, yes, 100%. A lot of weights, like Dragon Quest games, I don't know how the hell they do it. They must have a crack team of writers because Dragon Quest, Dragon Age Inquisition, sorry, not Dragon Quest. Dragon Age Inquisition relies on a lot of the choices you made in previous games and has a tapestry. The scene uh, when you go meet the mages in um, Redcliffe, right? Uh -huh. In Redcliffe. Who comes and talks to you? Is it Alistair? Is it Anora? Is it Alistair and Anora? All those things, that takes a lot of programming. So if you go with option one, oh my God, uh, you got a lot of work ahead of you. Well, on a smaller scale, I was thinking of a Dragon Age 2 that takes place in Kirkwall. Yeah. And how you respond to certain people in the first uh, chapter yes. is reflected in how they treat you in later chapters. Yeah, so um, here's something to think about too. Also, Dragon Quest II, I was thinking about that. You have only three choices of your response with Hawk when you're responding to somebody. Mm -hmm. You can choose to be diplomatic, sarcastic, or aggressive, and people react differently. That's an amazing idea of, really, it, it doesn't change the story, but just how people react. Mm -hmm. So your choices have almost no weight on the story itself when you're choosing those dialogue options, the dialogue wheel. Mm -hmm. But you're changing how people react to you. Yeah. Whether they're friendly or rivals. So in that case, that's something to consider. Well, we gotta kinda catch up here a little bit. Okay, um, so let's see. Uh, we are not streaming PS P5. No, we do not stream play uh, Persona 5. No. We play it on the side. Yeah. Um, SB says, hey SB, welcome to the stream. Hey, Earl, you seem to be pretty gray of late. Earl hated that. Thank you. That's yes, awesome. Yeah. That is awesome, SV. Mm -hmm. um, Chaos, what do you mean? What are you not getting? Um, let us know what we can clarify. Uh, <laughs> took me a moment. Yeah. <laughs> Give Chaos a second to answer, uh, to re-ask his question. Um, so, yeah. The big important takeaway from all of this is the further you move to the left, on this graph, on this chart, mm -hmm. this, these pictures, uh, the more work you're going to have. On the left, is less work. Yeah. On the on, I mean, on the right is more is less work. Good heaven. Number one is going to give the player the most feeling that they are moving the world, but it's going to take the most work. Choice number three is the least amount of work for you, but the player is going to feel like they're just reading a book and playing a game. Right. Um, the examples, yeah, uh, if you've never played Dragon Age Inquisition, Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, or Dragon Quest Eleven, then you wouldn't know what we're talking about. So, yeah, you may have, we may have to find different games to kind of, yeah. SB, yeah, no, there's someone here, ba -doop boom name Earl. So, uh, Chaos, uh, you can ask for a later panel if you have any other questions or if you want us to go over any other examples, but let's move on for now. Okay. Um, level of Freedom. Now that you have the entire story drafted, including progression, and have decided on how the player's choice will influence things, you want to decide how much freedom they have in your world. You can go completely open world, where after the start of the game, which may or may not have a tutorial area, they have full run to go wherever they want, such as with Elder Scrolls. You can go with a semi-open world, which restrict places opening your world up more and more through the story, such as with Horizon Zero Dawn. You can go semi-linear, where the game forces the player down a path, but with plenty to explore along the way, such as with Dragon Quest XI. And you can go fully linear, where the player is pretty much progressing through levels with only side paths to explore, such as with Final Fantasy VII Remake. <laughs> That's funny, yes, but yes. The king needs your help. Can't talk. Eating. <laughs> Jeez, Wills. <laughs> but, but these are actually some good examples here. Um, Elder Scrolls, most of the Elder Scrolls, like most of Bethesda games in mm -hmm. general. Yeah. Once you complete that tutorial area, you just go do the world. Whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be a quest over there. Get more quests. Tons of quests. All the quests. More dots. More, more dots. More dots. So, yeah. Um, that's... There's a lot of work in those to make those actually work and fluid. We've seen a lot of open world games that suck. So let's 
you know, just keep in mind, an open world game takes a lot of work. It, it does, because you rely so much on environmental storytelling. Yep, which we get to that later. Yeah. Um, but here's the important thing to think about for an open world game. Does it suit your game? Because if you don't want to have a Elder Scrolls slash GTA 5 style game, you probably don't want to make your game open world. Mm -mm. You probably don't. Um, Semi-open, like Horizon, is a lot better if you want to have an open world feel, but you still want to have a tighter run on your narrative. Yeah. And then Semi-Linear, which is like literally most games that we that Teal and I have played uh, adventure-wise, um, yeah. uh, RPG-wise, most of them are going to fall into the Semi-Linear where you have to move around, you have to go to certain areas, but you get a lot of places to explore. Um, a lot of the Legend of Zelda games, Breath of the Wild excluded, are like that. Yep. Um, and then finally, fully linear is, yeah, you're basically playing the game through levels, but you're given exploration, like the slums in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Yeah. And that area, only, the slums literally only open up in FF7 Remake at the end of the game. Yes. Right before you go to Shinra mm -hmm. HQ. Yeah. For the most part, is a highly linear game, but it's still a linear game that allows for exploration. Do not do what Final Fantasy 13 did, where it is almost on rails. Oh, boy. And you're just going down a corridor, and you might go to the right to get a treasure chest. Please avoid that. Yeah. That is not fun. Um, it, it takes a very special kind of temperament to play a game like that. Um, the King Slime has been wreaking havoc on the town of Boringsville. You need to can't quest looting. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We love SP. So yeah, level yeah. of freedom. That's level really freedom. important for yeah. your story. And for both of those, player choice and level of freedom, it depends on the story you're telling. All yes, of it this, does. Yeah. All of this depends on your story concept, your scope, and what your main story ends up being. Yep. See how it all kind of cascades? It all is, is built upon that one foundation. Yep. All right. Shall all we right. come to Yes. All right. All right. Now you want to use pen and paper, although it's perfectly okay to use digital notes to draft your systems. Be sure to create the following notes. Battle system, core systems, secondary systems, character and enemy AI, and systematic progression. We will go over all of these in the alpha stage of game development. Again, important things to note here. Um... There is no one 100% or <laughs> Thank you, SB. Thank you, that makes me happy. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny too. Um, creating a video game, creating a book, and creating a tabletop RPG are all very similar. Yep. Exceedingly so, so yeah. But um, the important thing to note is this. The more preparation you do ahead of time, even if it's just writing a notepad, the less chances you're gonna have of things getting foobarred later on in development. You're going to notice when we get to alpha and beta that there's less slides. That's because really good game design focuses a lot on preparation and organization, and then the rest is the actual creation. Now, this is not as much time as you're going to spend in the engine, creating your world, creating your assets, creating mm -hmm. your, your mm -hmm. levels, your mechanics, etc. But you're going to spend a lot of time working on this stuff. So, yes, you will. Yeah, devs note, take advantage of the pre-alpha phase to organize yourself. Yeah. You'd want to draft enemy AI, doesn't it? No, no, no. Uh, the theory behind the enemy AI. We'll get to that on, uh, on on alpha. We're not actually talking about programming it until you get to the alpha stage. But you want to talk about, you want to write down, Earl, how you want your enemies to react. So you write your battle system first. Then you write your core systems and secondary systems. And then you go, okay, based off of how I want my game to flow syst systematically, here's how I want my characters and enemies to act um i want my enemies to be heat seeking mobs out on the field um i want them to uh chase after the the the, the character the uh, main character if they sense them for a certain amount of time that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're taking down a piece of paper and you're writing down how you want it to go so that when you actually get into your engine and you're programming it yeah exactly keep it in basic so yeah, that saves you time and development a lot. Um, like a blueprint, exactly, Chaos, mm -hmm. you got it. Or I don't want the enemy to to sense the character at all, that your 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 player character, until you 
entered a certain radius around right. them and then all of a sudden they sense you right that's that's what we're doing here mm -hmm. in pre-alpha yeah that's um, all it, what this is and because sb has been doing great things we'll just say sb says princess snoo snoo demands attention and i will not go any further because this is a wholesome stream it's a wholesome stream mm -hmm. yep, moving on okay <laughs> You should have your entire game on paper now, from start to finish, along with notes for yourself or other members of your team. Congratulations, you just created a draft of your game design document, your GDD. This is a major milestone in creation. Woohoo! Yes! So basically what we just did was we ninja'd you really hard. <laughs> um, everyone's always talking about how the GDD is this terribly horrifying thing to create. Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it, but you just made your draft. Yeah, you did. This is, is a draft of a GDD. Um, we are going to have a creator classroom on the game design document oh, one day. Oh, yeah. It's going to be long, and it's going to be involved because that is one of the most complex things in the industry as far as writing goes. I have that already. It's just in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, Mozart. It does no one any good in your head. <laughs> the whole game on paper? I don't think enough counter 60 for printing paper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, SB. Thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, um, to kind of end the pre-alpha stage. Yeah, um, ending the pre-alpha. You have everything written down, either on real paper, notebooks, or uh, digital notes. Evernote is a wonderful program. Everyone should use it. And uh, you're organized and ready to move on with the actual creation of your video game. Yeah. So shall we make a game, Teal? Let's make a game. Oh. Alpha stage. Ba -da -ba -da. This is where you complete the creation of your game from start to finish, making sure that every feature you want in the game is added. During the stage, you can add new features or ideas as needed, but only if necessary. You are now past the, this sounds cool, so I'll add it to my game phases. Please don't do that. You don't have to add all your assets and refinement to the game. Just focus on creating a working game that someone could play from start to finish. Focus on the mechanics and the gameplay. You can add the story elements later. You should absolutely use placeholder texts, graphics, and audio. Absolutely. So there's a lot going on here. What I just typed was, and mm -hmm. I know it kind of blinked a second, so hopefully I didn't mess up the stream for you guys. But um, it's called Evernote. Um, it's what I and Teal have been using for legitimately forever. I use it for my books, I use it for my tabletop, and I use it for our video games. Um, it is a wonderful note-taking program that allows you to sync your phone with your with your computers, your desktops, or laptops. So if I am out with Teal and I say, hey, I just thought of something, I can tap it into my Evernote mm -hmm. and it'll be at my PC later on. It's right. not that expensive either. Oh, no problem, no problem. Um, so the alpha stage is often confused with the early alpha. Yeah. And it's early and it's often confused with the beta. The whole point of the alpha stage is to create a working game, an alpha, that a person can get from start to finish and play. You know, that's the whole point. You are making the game so that the game can be played. Is it going to be buggy? Yes. Is it going to yes. have the right uh, music and graphics and sounds? No. Is it going to be something that you'd want to show anyone else other than people on your dev, dev team? <laughs> Heck no. But it is a working thing. It's beyond a prototype. It's beyond a proof of concept. It's beyond that vertical slice. This is the full game in its completion with a bunch of placeholders and stuff added in. A lot of people will say, hey, my game is an early alpha or a pre-alpha. No, no, it's not. It's an alpha. You can play the game, even if it's only part of it, it's, it's an, an alpha. alpha. Even if it's an early access, which is its own thing, alpha. Um, and yes, the problem with alphas is when you run into a game-breaking bug before the game even starts. And alpha, well, uh, sure. absolutely anything game-breaking, you want to take care of that as soon as possible. So, yeah. Yeah, you just, yeah, you fix all the problems because, yeah. you know, this is where it's at. This is it. This is where you're making your game, this right? This is here. your absolute best time right now to make the game, to fix the things that will destroy your game, and to recognize if there's a limit of technology. Yes. You In pre-alpha, you've already been working on the basics. Does the engine work? Can the engine support me? That's fine. Everything's right. great. But you're not going to know every single bit until you're in the meat of creating your alpha. If you're in the meat of creating your alpha and suddenly realize your game engine can't support it, oh, that boy. may be a cutting up the losses moment yeah. and walking away. So, all right, we got here. I really wish I could do this, but using placeholders makes my heart hurt. Ah, I understand. Yes. 
Earl, the best thing I can do is to, yes, that last statement, get over that. You do not want to create your assets while you're making your alpha. This is a mistake that, that I made early on yes. in my game developing. I I absolutely once held up steel on the project because mm -hmm. I was so busy making these pretty sprites. Mm -hmm. And I didn't I wasn't supposed to be doing that. I was just supposed to be uh, populating a town with some sprites and I needed to move on to another map. Yep. So I learned the hard way. Don't do that. There are so many people indie game developers and from the community where we got our starts there's so many people in the rpg maker community who think that they have to create the game with all its assets while they're creating the game yeah and that is a massive mistake um it is the best way to make your project go a lot longer than it should mm -hmm. it is the best way to shoot yourself in the foot because if you spend all this time creating a pretty asset and you never need it you just wasted your time. Ooh, yeah. Did you waste your time as far as the artistic value of creating something you may need later? No, of course not. That's intrinsic. But we're talking about actually working under a schedule and trying to get a game out before the stars burn out. Yeah. So, yeah, I am with you 100%, Earl, and so is Teal. I, I get it, Earl. Yeah. But yeah. move move beyond that. Use the placeholders. And once your alpha is complete, then add them in. Add in all those mm -hmm. beautiful things you can make. Uh, all the assets, uh, rather not... Ha ha ha. I'd rather not do that, given how many gigs of music. Yeah. So, exactly, yeah. SB. You want to yeah. bare bones. Your alphas are bare bones. That's, that's what Best they are. Best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. They're bare bones. They're functional, but not pretty. And okay. often not well written, either. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> the battle system. Oh, it's uh, Cloud Slime. It's, it's, yeah. This is how your game will handle combat, possibly included in a battle scene. When you create your battle system, please keep in mind how the player will progress through the levels in your game. It makes no sense to create a flashy, over-the-top action combat system if your maps don't account for it. Also, every conflict point in your story should be resolvable with your battle system, even if it's actually solved cinematically. Add all of your essential features into your battle system now leaving room for the peripheral ones before you start the beta stage. Okay, so I want to talk about that second to last point because this might confuse people. We're not saying that every single conflict get resolved in a fight. No. Not even. No, that's not, no. What we're just saying is that when you're designing your battle, your battle system, when you're putting your battle system together, whether you're designing it in Unreal Blueprints, uh, coding it in C-sharp and Unity, working with um, plugins to change the RPG Maker uh, default battle system, whenever, when you're designing your battle system, you want to make sure that any conflict point that you would have could be resolved in that battle system. Right. So if you are designing, so it's not restricting your story, it's don't restrict your battle system. If your battle system won't allow you to resolve a conflict, then that battle system may not be inclusive enough. Yeah. That's what you want to do. And this is more working on the theory of how the system works than it is actually the finished product. Because we all know that sooner or later you're going to subtract something from one of your features and not add 24 features onto it. Right. 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 <laughs> no feature creep. Um, so that's that right there. Um, also, when we say the possibility of a battle scene, that's your turn-based battle engine. That's mm -hmm. like, you know, you hit the enemy and poof, the screen shatters and you're standing there and like in Persona 5, beating the snot out of shadows. Right. That's a battle scene. You don't have to have that. You can have on-screen enemies. You can fight on right on screen like in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, you could fight on the map in the battle scene like in Dragon Quest XI where you hit the enemy, you're in the same map, you haven't actually gone anywhere, you're just now standing and turn basing each other to death. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to do that and you need to decide how that battle engine is going to work with your game and your concept, not force your game and your concept to work in the battle engine. Uh, Emma says, I'm not really good at creating battle systems. I don't know, maybe you are. I mean, if you're on our Discord, toss your battle system theory out there on uh, the Game Dev channel. Yeah, there, there's lots of people on yeah. there that have done this and they can help you and give you good advice. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, when we moved the Rosenhearts to Unreal, um, I wrote a document on the Fate system, which is the battle engine for Rosenheart. Yeah. And I had about three or four people in the community look at it to tell me if they felt it was sound from a theory standpoint right um so sb says already got a semi fleshed out battle system done there's a few hiccups here and there 
Well, there you go. See, yeah, that's good. good. That, I, that makes me happy, SB. You always want to continue to um, innovate with your engine, mm -hmm. innovate with your system. Um, imagine a day every day in the life battle with a fridge. <laughs> a fridge falls on the player. Ah, that's clever. <laughs> that's clever, SB. What is the best to worst battle systems you have seen? Oh, wow. That sounds. That's getting into AMA territory, but I will answer that chaos. The best battle system I have seen recently that's action oriented is FF7 Remake. The best one I've seen that's turn based ever. God, I'd almost have to say it's one of the Atlier systems. Like, Atlier's crazy good, despite yeah. the fact that it's basically just one giant fetch quest. No, uh, the Atelier series that I've played have done the battle systems very well, just yeah. turn based. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the worst battle systems I've ever seen. Okay, before we move on, um, I was not a fan of FF13s. Ooh. At all. Because all I could do was move lightning, and I was just clicking the same thing over. It was very annoying. Ooh, yeah. Not um, bad. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's move on, honey. Let's move on, yes. Core systems. These are the systems that are completely needed to play the game. The ones that you cannot strip away, no matter what, without drastically altering your game concept. Examples are the command box from the Final Fantasy VII Remake and the target of parts on robot dinosaurs in Horizon Zero Dawn. Both of these are fundamental aspects of the game. It's perfectly okay to add in your core systems before your battle system, or in tangent if that makes more sense, because technically the battle system is a core system. And in this example, both the command box, which is what happens when you press X and time slows to a crawl so you can get Cloud to do a thing, um, as well as targeting parts of robot dinosaurs in order to either make them go shock, burn on fire, blow their butts off, whatever. And blow their butts off, That's yes. All, that is, both of those are part of the battle system, but they're core systems nonetheless. Yeah. Um, your core system is literally this. If you took your, if you took, let's say if system A, if you take system A away, your game will cease to be your game. That's a core system. If you can take system A away and your game can continue to function and be your game, then it's not a core system. Uh, flying and knights uh, into dreams, that old uh, Sega Saturn game. That's a core system. Um, ooh, that was a quick one. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was actually pretty good. <laughs> I just thought it was a Ah, that. That is a cool, yes. Oh, yes. Good example of right. a core system. It wouldn't be Fallout mm -hmm. if you didn't have that. Yes. For the 3D Fallout. Absolutely. Good mm -hmm. example, SB. Yes. Um, it would be, it would stop being Fallout and become something else. Right. Um, the level progression, uh, the doing an, I, doing an action makes you better at that action and eventually gives you experience in all the Elder Scrolls games. That's a core system. That is. It would stop being an Elder Scrolls game if casting Fireball didn't make your destruction go up. Or um, <laughs> running silently against a wall <laughs> with, a, with a bear sleeping nearby, raising your sneak. <laughs> yeah. I've done that. Yep. We're, na <laughs> we're naming them right now, Chaos. Those are core systems. Yes, those are core systems. Um, gosh, a core system of the Atelier series is alchemy. Mixing, mixing this thing with that thing to make a better thing. Yeah. That's a core system. It wouldn't be the Atelier series. So a core system isn't always going to be a battle system. A core no. system isn't always going to be something that would be a core system in another game. Mm -hmm. The core system is simply, without that system, your game wouldn't be your game. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay, let's go to secondary systems. <coughs> These are the systems that add needed flavor to the game. If they were taken out of the game, the game would not change on a fundamental level even if it was negatively impacted. Examples are the fun size Forge in Dragon Quest XI or the Materia system in the Final Fantasy VII Remake. During the alpha stage, feel free to add or subtract your secondary systems. If something doesn't work or detracts from the experience, remove it. If something added will enhance the experience, then add it. However, Avoid adding too many systems, as that causes feature creep, which you never want to have in your game. So, a uh, quick thing here. Uh, example number two, the Materia system. You could build a case that that's a core system. I'm not going to sit here and get into a debate over that. If you disagree and think that uh, Materia in Final Fantasy VII Remake is a core system, let us know either on chat or in the comments. I'm not going to argue that point. Because it is a matter of debate. However, 
the weapon core system for ah. weapon modifications in Final Fantasy VII Remake is absolutely secondary. Mm -hmm. And the fun size forge, which is the best crafting system I have legitimately ever seen, <laughs> no. is still secondary because yeah. Dragon Quest can be played without you it. You can play without it. Uh, too many feature creeps. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So the worst thing you can ever do to your game uh, in the terms of features and systems is go, oh, this is cool. I'm going to add this. Oh, this is cool. I'm going to add this. Oh, this is cool. I'm going to add this. Because then you get feature creep and feature creep is terrible. Oh, it, God. It will make people think your game is literally just a tech demo as mm -hmm. opposed to a game. Yeah. Um, Just avoid it. I, I'll subtract more than add and I think you'll be fine. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. if you have any other questions about systems, because we're actually exiting out of core and secondaries and moving on to the next piece. Yep. Uh, which is what uh, I believe we talked about earlier. Yeah. It is. Character AI. There we go. This is how your characters, both good and bad, will act in the various areas of your game, such as cities, wilderness, dungeons, etc. This doesn't include enemy groups, also called mobs or troops moving about within an area that is coming up next this also includes how they will act within a combat situation such as the battle scene if they are controlled by the game's ai player controlled characters would be decided in the battle system part this will include ai schedules if you have any such as the radiant ai used in skyrim or the day night npcs in games like ocarina of time or Dragon Quest XI. We reference Dragon Quest XI because it's actually a really good example of how to design a game. Yeah. From a, from a technical level. From a technical level. It is, it's a good game too, but technically it's very well put together. Um, I'm going to let you guys in on a little trade secret about the industry. Um, the there's, there's a couple of terms, but one of the big ones is this. If the player's not controlling it, it's technically called an agent AI. It's, it's, it's an AI. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad, a monster, a shrub, a treasure chest that tries to bite your face off, or um, a flower that sings um, Pete, Piccolo Pete. I mean, literally, it doesn't matter. If the player controls it, it's technically called the player avatar. If the player doesn't control it, it's called an AI. We are differentiating between characters and enemies just for the sake of breaking it down easier. But there's no difference. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're designing your characters, these are your NPCs, these are things that are not just going to, by default, try to murder the player to death. You want to look at how they're going to act when the player's on screen, looking at them and interacting with them, and when they're not. So things like your day-night cycles, your mm -hmm. radiant AI, your yep. schedule AI, all of that, whether or not they run when a battle starts, join in when a battle starts, whether or not you see them in the background running around like chickens with their head cut off while you're in the battle scene, all of that you need to determine during planning it in the pre-alpha phase and doing it in the alpha phase yes yeah moving on and yes a shrubbery <laughs> okay let's move on to enemy ais where does slime go oh shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah dragon breathed fire on him he ran this is how your enemies effectively anything that can be classified as an enemy mob or troop this is how your enemies act in your various areas dungeon or otherwise the AI not only deals with combat situations, but also patrols, searches for the player's character, and even story-enriching interactions. For that last one, the story-enriching interactions, it is highly recommended that you include these. Conversations between enemies, such as bandits engaging in idle banner in Skyrim's many dungeons, or just activities such as the monster classroom in Dragon Quest XI's Royal Library. These add so much to your world. Um, no, not this. He'll be fine. He'll be back in the next slide, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about those two examples and why we're differentiating. So AI is still AI. It means that the player is not controlling them. Right. Um, in example one, it breathes life into the bandits because if you if you actually sneak through a Skyrim dungeon mm -hmm. and you have the right mods in that actually make dialogue happen, you can hear the bandits talk about things like "It's not my girl," or, "It's not my my, my child," "She's lying." Um, they'll talk about "Hey, what the boss has been up to." Just kind of little pieces like that that make it feel like they're living people that you have yeah. to kill and not just faceless monsters. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I've I've sat there and listened to. Uh, enemy conversations quite often in mm -hmm. the games that I play. 
um, Dragon Quest XI, the Monster Classroom is the best example. Mm -hmm. That's where you go into that that library, and uh, it's actually a dragon professor is teaching a bunch of monsters something, and you interrupt to kill them all, but it was an amazing moment mm -hmm. where those monsters seemed alive. Yeah. Um, the slimes in Dragon Quest XI, um, hopping away, running from you, going into bushes because you're the crazy guy at the sword. Right. These are all things that you can do to make these enemy AIs seem like they're more than just stuff out there for you to kill. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you can also make them, how do they search for you? You know, do they come across a dead body and sound the alert? Do they mm -hmm. go into a caution phase where they're looking for you and other people are searching? Horizon Zero Dawn is amazing with that. Um, you know, what do the enemies do when they know danger is nearby? Yes. Because you want to look at it in terms of this. To the enemy, you're the enemy. Yes. To the and as long as it's a good keep, good concept, keep in their mind to the to the kings out on the field that you're going to kill, you're actually the bad guy trying to kill them, and mm -hmm. they're trying to survive or beat you. Right. Keep that in mind, and yeah, you'll, you'll mm -hmm. go real well. Hey, that guy just murdered a far breathing dragon. Let's take their gold. Yeah. Yes. Um, we we are going to do a creator classroom on AI. This came from the huge issues we had with the companion AI in Final Fantasy VII Remake. Mm -hmm. But you just brought up a great point, SB. Bandits should be running shitless from you if you just killed a dragon and right. shouted it out of the sky. Mm -hmm. And that is a flaw in AI, in the yeah. Skyrim AI. Yeah. They should be running away. At the very least, those bandits should not be messing with you. Correct. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on. All right. Uh, he's back. Oh, he's got to focus. <laughs> he's got to focus. Now, now he won't be uh, attacked. Yeah, he he won't right. be You'll jumped. see the dragon coming and get away. Okay. So now we're posing a question. At what point in your story should a system become available to the player? It's not a good idea to open everything at once. Instead, pace each system's availability as the game progresses. Opening up new systems as the player moves through the game allows them to learn a system, practice that system, and be comfortable with that system before moving on. If your game is so open world that you must have all systems open at game start, such as with Skyrim, then have a tutorial moment when each system is first encountered. Never just dump a player into everything. It's so unbelievably... Ugh. Oh, it is, it's disorientating. Yeah. It is totally disorientating. Please don't do it. Um, Skyrim and a few other open world games get away with it literally because they pop something on your screen and said, hey, to do this, do this. Yeah. To accomplish this task, do this. However, we highly recommend that if you're going to do that, also have a journal of sorts or a tutorial thing in the menu that lets them revisit something they may have accidentally spammed the X button and missed. A really good example of a game that progresses its systems really well is Trails of Cold Steel. Yeah. I loved how that they, they progress you through the first mm -hmm. battle system. Then they progress you through the social... Well, actually, they progress you through the social system, and then the battle system. Mm -hmm. Then they progress you through the Argus system, where you can basically do combos with your friends. Then they give you more on the social system. Then they give you more on the cooking system. You, know, mm -hmm. you start making cookies with your friends. Little bit by little bit, Trails of Cold Steel teaches you more and more and more and yes, more until you're doing everything. That's right. Um, Persona 5, also an amazing game, does that as well. Mm -hmm. So if it's better, in, in Studio Blue's opinion, to pace your systems with your game and your story progression instead yeah. of just going, here's everything, isn't that cool? Because as um, SB said earlier, ooh, a new plugin adds, ooh, a new plugin adds, ooh, piece of candy adds, oh, why is my game a carrot? Basically, yes. Mm -hmm. And the same thing yeah. happens if you throw all the systems at the players right from they start. They're going to be like, how do I play your game? I don't understand. And then they just give up. Confused players do not play a game. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> shall we move on? All right. Let's um, wrap up your alpha, shall we? Yep. Go through your entire game from start to finish several times. Make sure that the systems you have to move your story forward do not detract from the gameplay and are fun for the player. If a system doesn't do anything other than just exist for the heck of it, you should really cut it from your game. This is where you can get peer feedback, such as Let's Players. However, 
be absolutely sure to mention that this is a late alpha so that they will know that elements like written dialogue and assets may be missing. Do not add features beyond this point if at all possible, as it can make the refinement and bug testing portion considerably more difficult. So to answer your question, Earl, right now, um, the deeper you go into your alpha, the less you want to consider adding a system. Yeah. So at the very beginning of your alpha, when you've just finished pre-alpha and you're now in alpha, okay, yeah, you can get away with it. Yeah, you can get away with it. it. Later on, a little deeper in, yeah, it's fine. You're halfway in, might want to think about things. You know, is it really necessary? Um, but by the time you get to this stage, you really don't. Yeah. In fact, you want to be looking at what you can cut as opposed to what you can add. <laughs> um, so SB says, if you're going to add a bunch of features functions in the game with minimal tutorial help that you accidentally skipped, please look, yes, add the documentation option, which is what we said. Yes. Add a tutorial, some option to go into a menu and mm -hmm. read the damn thing. I'm actually a big fan of having a journal in your menu. Yes so that a player can reference it for anything from, from rules to um, icons, tile sets, you know, what, what, what does the poison icon look like? That sort of thing. Right. I'm a big fan of journals. Right now, obviously journal can also be considered a quest journal, but what Teal is talking about is literally what SB said, a documentation. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Oh, okay. So Earl's asking, no, I mean, from the last slide, the battle mechanics. Uh, I think I understand what you're saying. Hold on, let me skip back real quick. Let's go back to the battle. Systematic progression. Oh, I see. Uh, technically, Earl, <coughs> technically you can add in your last system right before the last dungeon and the last battle. Technically. Mm -hmm. You absolutely can. Um, there is no hard and fast rule at all. Um, it's what you as the developer feel is the most comfortable. Personally, I try to get all of these systems added in within the first half of the game, but that's a personal opinion. There is no hard and fast rule. So, to kind of answer it in a definitive way, you as the developer, when you are the most comfortable adding in no more features, add in your last feature and wrap it up. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. All right. Shall we move on? Actually, give them a second. Yeah, we, uh, because this is the alpha stage. I'm going to be moving on. So, any other questions about the alpha stage? Right. Right. Yeah. First half sounds good, but thanks. It is, there is no hard rule. Yeah, no. absolutely. Um, yeah, don't feel limited. Um, yeah, I think for every game we've ever done, it's mm -hmm. been the, within the first half. We've added all the systems in. Yeah. I, I, my philosophy, I think yours too, ha has always been uh, let's let's teach them up front. Right. And then you'll have that knowledge throughout the rest of the game. Pretty much, yeah. Our Like Teal said, our philosophy is that first half of the game, first third to first half is learning. Mm -hmm. And then, then we test you, which is right. would, more and yeah. more challenges. More challenges. Until the final battle, the final test. Which, yeah, the, the, the final boss fight is everything you've learned in the game. Right. To defeat to that To defeat challenge. that one challenge, yep. yes. All right, let's move on. Okay, guys, here we go. Beta. Ooh, he got his highlighter. He ready to go. This is where you refine, balance, and test your game. Refinement means adding in writing that flushes out your story. Visual and aural assets that create your atmosphere and lore and environmental storytelling that creates a deep world. Balancing means that you go through the game along with peers and testers and make sure that your game's difficulty is progressive in a natural way. The key word here is natural. The player should always feel like they got a good handle or even mastered something before moving onward. Testing means ironing out as many bugs as humanly possible. So a couple of things on here. Um, first off, we're going to reference past and future creator classrooms here as well. Yes. Um, I mentioned We mentioned something at the end of Alpha, and that is that's when you want to start looking at possible Let's Players. That is the earliest you want someone to play your game is a late alpha. Mm -hmm. That is the late, the earliest, the absolute earliest. We're going to tag at a certain point in beta where we recommend you start reaching out to Let's Players. Mm -hmm. Because there's a part where, and Teal and I kind of came to this agreement, that we feel that a game should at that point be looked at publicly. You can start sending out your game to private testers and peer reviewers, like if you want to contract 
services of someone like Studio Blue or whatever to look at your game privately as soon as you get into that late alpha stage. Mm -hmm. So we're talking right now, when we talk about Let's Players, we're talking about public exposure, not private contracted peer review. Right. Um, okay, so let's see. Ironing out bugs explains why I barely got any hair left you cute. Uh, Emma says, my first game I released had a battle that was random. You could win or not. Ooh, oh, <laughs> my. <Hell. laughs> but you learned from your mistakes, Emma, so yeah. that's good. All right, shall we move on to the b -b -b beta? Okay. Beta time. Beta, beta. Here we go. <laughs> Earl says, oh. I feel like lore world building is foundational how the world looks, country positioning, and thus story progression and other things. Um, you'll understand what we get when we get to it. We're not talking about writing it. We're talking about implementing it. So... Earl, you are correct. Writing your lore and your world building is foundational and belongs in pre-alpha. Yes, it is. That's does. right there with, with scope, world store, uh, main story, and all that. In fact, we probably should have added that in. We just didn't think of it. So all of that stuff you're talking about, pre-alpha. The implementation takes place in the beta. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Okay. Much of your writing may be rough at this point, and that's okay. Use this time to add in stronger writing to get your story across, as well as tell each character's story. Use the writing techniques we have taught in other classrooms to create fully flushed out characters. Flesh out your dialogue from start to finish. Have each character with a unique voice and cadence. Expand on your game script for the main story and side stories until it's all presented properly. Have your work checked by an editor and provide localization if it'll be in a language other than your own. If you have voice actors, only provide them the script once everything is finalized. Re-recording can get very tedious and expensive and some VAs will not do it. Right, so I mean, the professional VAs will probably do it if you pay them more. Yeah. Because re-recorded lines suck. But they're like your volunteer VAs, they may just say, no, I'm not. I don't mm -hmm. have time. And then you're stuck with lines you can't use. So for every person out there, whoever is going to do any voice acting in their game, whether it be RPG Maker, Unity, Unreal Go Dot, it doesn't matter. Do not give your VAs a script until it is 100% finalized in the beta and you aren't changing it. Yep. Please. Do not. Save yourself the <laughs> headache. I've been there. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions about writing, we will move on. We did a lot of creator classrooms on this. We so. have done, yeah, so and please we'll, refer to our previous classrooms yeah. on writing. And we will do more! So many more. So many more. By the way, Earl, if you really like um, world building, we're three deep in, and we're going to be doing our fourth one later this month. Yeah. So please catch our world building creator classrooms. They are so good. And we, it, it's participatory. The second half, we actually create stuff together. Yay. All right. Okay. Oh, wait. wait. My screenwriting teacher said, cover up the names of your characters in script. If you don't know who they are without name. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. good. Mm. Yes. Good tip. Mm. Mm. Oh, that is so legit. Oh, that's so credibly legit. Mm. Thank you. Sorry. I had a writer's moment. I really did. Um, Earl, not many people get that, but it's true. If you can't tell who the character is from how they speak, you don't, you're not writing the character properly. Thank yep. you. Oh, you just gave me like a million hearts just now. <laughs> <sighs> okay, here we go. Okay. Your visual theme is the unifying look of your game. This includes the user interface, the color palette, use of particle effects, to lighting, and so much more. We cannot overstate the importance of lighting, even in a 2D game. The same is for color palette, even though all elements are important. We go over this heavily in its own Creator Classroom and encourage you to watch it. Yeah, our visual theme Creator Classroom was one of our longer ones. Yeah. And we really dissect. In fact, honestly, we highly recommend if you really want to get into the visuals of your game, regardless of the engine, watch our Color Theory Creator Classroom and then watch our Visual Theme Creator Classroom. Yes. It ties in a lot of stuff and really shows you how you can use light, color, the color palette, um, all these different elements, pull them together to make your game visually recognizable. Mm -hmm. So, please. Okay, moving on. Okay. Similar to your visual theme, 
This is the unification of audio elements to draw your player into the game. And what exactly is that? Your audio will... No, no. What is the aural theme? Is that the aural theme? This is the aural theme. Aural theme. Okay, go ahead. Aural theme. Aural theme. theme. Got it. Please continue, Jill. Your audio will tell your story just as much as visuals and writing. This can include the game soundtrack, environment soundscapes, sounds in the user interface, and so much more. Every sound needs to make the player think of the game, from the famous Final Fantasy Victory to the classic 8-bit sounds in Dragon Quest XI. This will be a future Creator Classroom, so please watch it when it comes out. That's right. We've often talked about sound design and aural themes. I can never get that right. Aural themes. Audio themes. Sound themes. Uh, but you need to have those because uh, we are literally, that's one half of the world. The other half is what you see. In a video game, it's mm -hmm. what you see and what you hear. You don't get to really get to use the other senses. Right. Tactile, uh, gustatory, or olfactory. I got those right. Mm -hmm. Yet I can't say aural. Um, but those are very important. Now, SB did bring up a great point prior to this, back on visual. Color palettes. If you're going for a serious, realistic game, muted colors. If you're going for QT, yeah. Saturation. Yes, absolutely, SB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. Color palette matters. Yep. And yes, back to Eternal Sonata. <laughs> we love that game. Yes, they're Chopin, arra uh, Chopin arrangements. Yes. Yes, and it is integral to the plot. Because Chopin's the main character. Mm -hmm. Well, him and Polka. But they're, yeah, the protagonist is mm -hmm. Chopin. Yeah. So, yes, um, it unifies everything. Um, really, honestly, there's not much more we can go into unless you have a specific question. Because uh, this is going to be its own creator classroom. Because as Teal and I have talked about, aural elements are mm -hmm. super important. Very important. So Final Fantasy VII's victory theme plays. Who are you people? Record scratch. Yep. Yeah. Or no, the best part ever is when the Final Fantasy VII victory theme is the uh, the ringtone. That was amazing. Yeah. The ringtone. Uh, but that's for another classroom. Can we move on? Let's move on. Atmosphere. This is how your visual and aural themes come together to create the look and feel of your game. A good atmosphere changes by location to emphasize what the location is in relation to the story. A dungeon should not feel like a palace. A mountain path should not feel like a city. A salt flat should not feel like sand dunes, and so forth. It can also change by the story such as a vibrant and happy world suddenly going dark and sinister when the bad guy wins. When a game's atmosphere is bland and uninteresting, or even worse, cookie cutter, the entire game suffers, such as what happened with Dragon Age 2. When this is complete, you should start sending out your game for peer review. People like Studio Blue, Driftwood Gaming, Hawk Zombie, Toasty, Jack of All Ops, I'm Reading Out Everybody, Hard Reset, and more. The community is full of us. The RPG Maker community, which we, uh, which we started Studio Blue in, is full of tons of Let's Players. Lots of, of options there for peer review. And they will all give you amazing, in their own way, feedback. So yeah. each person is going to give you something a little different. And they'll probably play your game online. But this is the part, so before I talk about what SB says, right here, when you've included your atmosphere, which is the unification of your visual and aural themes, this is when we feel you should send out your game to be played. Yeah. Because yeah. at this point, your, your game looks like it's finished product. It sounds mm -hmm. like it's finished product. It may not be it's finished product, but it's gonna look and sound like it. Um, SB says, what if the palace is a dungeon? When I say dungeon, I mean the, like a dungeon with like manacles and like stones. With, with, the, with the stone walls yeah. and the dripping water and the, yeah. the, the gross dirty floor. We're not talking about the fact that anything in a video game where you explore an area that's dangerous, especially in an RPG, is called a dungeon. Right. Dora the Explorer. Dora the Explorer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I think we should move on. <laughs> <sighs> What's okay. next on? Okay, so next. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, game lore. Woohoo! Lore is the story of the world and its inhabitants. Along with writing, add the lore into the player's path. The lore that they have to know to complete the game, which is the vital lore, needs to be along the critical path in a way that they cannot miss, such as dialogue and cinematics. The lore that just fleshes out the world 
optional lore can be something that they can miss, such as books and side story cutscenes. Be consistent with your lore and do not break your world lore unless you have an in-story reason to do so. Like finding out that the world is contained within a dream or something like that. Right, right, right. So uh, to kind of circle back, this is where you put your lore that you've already written into the game. Yep. <laughs> and you make it be so that the player will find out what the lore is. And um, Bethesda's amazing at using this. And um, if you want to write 100 books, you go right ahead and write yeah, 100 books. you write 100 books. Um, Dragon Quest XI does a great job of it, too. You don't have to read all those red books, but it helps if you do. Um, yeah. So, and the lore, remember, lore doesn't have to be, even though we have a book showing, a lore does not have to be written. Lore can be something someone says, like uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake or Horizon Zero Dawn. You find out the lore through conversation with NPCs. Well, yeah. I mean, go up to a bar and talk to the bartender. He tells you something. Talk yeah. to the patrons in the pub. There you go. They they tell you stuff about yeah. the world, the current events, yep. um, the weather. It, maybe maybe you know it, it's it's been snowing and it shouldn't be snowing. That right. sort of thing. So you can you can find out all kinds of things through conversation. World building moments or lore moments. Yeah. Also, computer terminals. You have a right. futuristic world. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Again knocking the snot out of Final Fantasy 13 because it did so many things wrong, a lot of the world's lore is inside the menu. Yeah! Like, something happens and then you have to click on the menu button and you have to go and yeah. read the journal that tells you the story that tells you stuff you didn't even actually do or see in the game. Terrible. I... You can tell I have do not like Final Fantasy 13. Yeah. Um, how many game companies retcon their lore? Too many? The, and that is a very bad practice. Yeah. And they've become very much screw you and flipping the middle finger at their fans, which is shitty, but it is their right. However, we don't have to like it. No. And we can call them out. And on as it. indie devs, we can do better. Yeah, you can. If you want to tell a seven game series, ah ha ha, then have your lore be consistent. Yes, please. What that means is you just plan better. Yeah. Plan your seven games. You don't have to plan out every single one of them, but plan out the meta story that connects them so you don't break your lore later on. Yeah. And if you have to, if there's no other way that you have to break your lore, do it in a way that works. Mm -hmm. Um. Make an alternate timeline. Um, we're alternate dream, timeline we're is, yeah, is you know, has been used. Right. Um, there are tons of ways. Uh, it, it was all a dream has been used. So, yeah, well, you know, um, those are acceptable. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to use the it's a dream unless it's part of the story, like Link's Awakening. Yeah. It was all just a dream. Okay. Yeah. That worked because he was in a dream world. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, the Matrix. The Matrix is you know, a good stuff example. Like that. Yeah. So there are, you know, there are outs, um, but you definitely don't want to just go break. Yeah. You don't want to. Mm hmm. Disney, a while back, thought they bought oh, out the Star Wars Retcon yeah. Lost. That, oh, God. Oh, yeah. Don't even get me started on that SB. That is a. That is a Friday night AMA steel rant. Like, <laughs> legit. Okay, um, people like Timothy Zahn did not deserve what happened to him, happened to him, even yeah. though he was actually given more consideration than others. Um, some amazing people just had their works basically pooted on mm -hmm. because of that. So, we'll yeah. move on to something else, though. I don't want to talk about that. Okay, that's Friday. Let's move on to environmental storytelling. I, because that, that's one of my favorite things to, to it work on. It truly is. This is when you use the environment itself to tell parts of a story wherein the player doesn't need to interact with it instead of being told about it, reading about it, or watching it unfold. When done right, it can be the most powerful type of storytelling any game developer can use. See the Dark Souls series. Mm -hmm. Consider having each area of your game contain one piece of environmental storytelling. Add more if you want, but obviously don't saturate. It's perfectly okay to have someone with the player's character comment on what is seen or have nothing be said at all. This will be a future creator classroom, yes, so please watch it when it comes out. Right, and Reverie, welcome to the stream. Sour, you are late. Uh, we have been beating the crap out of this one for an hour and 43 minutes. Oh my gosh. This was in depth, um, and we're not done yet. But yeah, environmental storytelling is massively important. And mm -hmm. we talk about the Dark Soul series because they are masters at it. Yes, they Dark are. Dark Soul is I do one of the best. I mean, it's better than Bethesda, and I will mm -hmm. give Bethesda its chops for its environmental storytelling. Um, it's better than anything Square Enix yeah. has ever mm -hmm. made. And Square Enix has made some good shit. But, like, 
Literally, you want good environmental storytelling, load up a Souls game. Mm -hmm. Anything in the Souls series, even Demon Souls, Bloodborne, don't matter. It's amazing. Always do that. Always put in at least one element of environmental storytelling per area. Just do that. It adds something to your world that you can't do with anything else. Yeah. It makes your world feel alive. And that's the big thing. If you can make your world feel alive, the players will appreciate it so much more than if it wasn't. You could have the best story. You mm -hmm. could have the best characters. You could have the most fun system. But if your world doesn't feel alive, just like it's being played in, mm -hmm. the players are going to feel like there's something missing. You add that environmental storytelling and the other stuff we've talked about. Yeah. Especially the environmental storytelling. And the players will suddenly feel like they're in a living world. Yeah. And they'll be like, holy shit, this game is so good. Um, let me see what we got here. However, don't saturate. You hear that L's. Stop hoarding all them damn forests. Yeah. Hey, Tron, welcome to the stream. My personal theory is Dark Souls doesn't actually have a story and they just trick people thinking they do. And Tron, if that's the case and Dark Souls does it through environmental storytelling, then that is God tier. Yeah, that's amazing. That, that's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. if, if you're correct and they're able to fool you through environmental storytelling, I can't even. Wow. I yeah. wish I could be that good. Uh, the world should tell the story itself. Exactly, Earl. Layers of history within one building. Thank you. Yeah. Earl, you're going to get along really well here. That is absolutely 100% the case. Yes, it is. Ooh. <laughs> All right, are we doing another? Yeah. Move yeah. on? Yeah, move let's, on. let's move on to the next bit. It, did um, dum, Actually, we have Rimshot. Uh, exclamation point Rimshot. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> game balancing. Ooh, this is the bug one. Yeah. You must balance your game, and you cannot use yourself or anyone on your team as the metric for if your game is properly balanced. You will need help from someone else in order for you to balance the game. Take each section of the game, each chapter, each area, even down to each level, and have someone play through it. Either you or they take notes on the exact amount of difficulty that they have, as well as the resources that they use. Then repeat this for every difficulty setting you have. Hell, thank you so much for the subs. Oh, it's CJ Sleepy. Thank you. Oh, you want Studio Blue Best Game Devs Ever Donut Me. <laughs> we love you cj thank you so much for being here thank you for the sub three months three months that's, that's incredible amazing. thank you thank you right. uh getting back to game balancing yes the idea here is to teach the player a mechanic or system have them practice that mechanic or system and then test them on it usually through a boss fight you always want the player to be just one step ahead of the game so long as they play smart never rely on the RNG to make or break a playthrough. We just finished for Digika playing an amazing RPG game, RPG Maker game. Mm -hmm. Um, Odikia, 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 Odikia. God, I can't pronounce anything. Odikia. It used some of the best balancing I've ever seen, and it was using the small numbers. Yeah, it was. because it didn't. And the dev said this: I don't rely too hard on the RNG. I rely on the formulas. So. I can't overstate enough how much importance this is. This will be its own creator classroom, and it's going to be a very mathematically... I don't want to scare you guys away. It'll be a very, very involved creator classroom because we're going to talk about the theory. The big important thing is this. Someone who's not you or another developer has to be a part of game balancing. Whether it's the Let's Player who you get, whether it be your buddy... Um, <laughs> your mom. Yeah, your mom. <laughs> no, I promise it will not be a math heavy. I will never do that to you guys. Um, but you've got to have somebody other than yourself and your team to play through this. For game balancing. Okay, because, because you've done this and done it and done it. Um, you know the ins and outs of it. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a impartial judge on your game balancing. You know how to cheat. And mm -hmm. even, you know how to trick. You know exactly what to do to win. And even if you try to play dumb. I just, but you're gonna, you're not, you can't, it's no. not possible. So your balancer needs to be someone who didn't actually create. Yep. Um, in very large teams, they actually have the balancing is done by QA. Yes, it is. So you yeah. actually have a QA department. And what they do is they say, hey, this part here is unbalanced. I'm getting killed in five seconds. And then the developers and the programmers go, okay. okay. And they fix it. Um, balancing goes hand in hand with bug testing, but since it's its own monster, we had it, it give its own slide. Yes. Um, and again, Please do not rely on that RNG. RNG is, not, like SB says, RNG is not your friend. No, it's not. Not your friend. Mm -mm. 
Oh, Earl says, game balancing and progression without levels is something I'm going to try in my game. Good luck. Good yeah. Luck, Earl. That sounds awesome. Yes. Um, whether your progression is gear-based or point-based or whatever it is, um, see how that works out for you. And if you could, take notes on it and then maybe present your findings once you've released that game to other people in the community and say, hey, I tried this thing out and here's what I learned. Yes. Because that's good. That would be very helpful. Too many games, especially in the RM community, rely on just leveling up normally. Mm -hmm. And they really shouldn't. There should be other ways. Shall we? Let's go to bug testing. Wait, how I thought it was a trick, but Steel said cheat, so I'm going to go... Same thing. Trick and cheat, it don't matter. Same word. Yeah, it's it's chaos. It's how you as the developer know how to fix up, how to go through a challenge. <laughs> on. Okay, bug testing. Bugs. You can and should test for and catch bugs during development. Mm -hmm. However, once your game is balanced, you should focus hardcore on bug testing. Get someone else to help, paying them if you must, and track your bugs in some sort of tracking software, like Hack and Play. Consider hiring professional bug testers, ones that are proven to have tested games thoroughly. Do not default to, that's not a bug, it's a feature. And don't forget to fix those big problematic bugs that your testers find, even if it delays your game's release. You will have bugs after launch, so don't worry. Focus on the game-breaking ones first, then move to the annoying ones that break the experience, and then the minor ones. Um, day one patches are horrible. Oh, like I hate them. Don't talk to me about day one patches. Day one patches are the reason that Teal and I never buy games when they first come out. We always wait a couple of months. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. matter how good the game is. I don't care if it's the best game in the world. We waited a month before Final Fantasy VII Remake, and that was the closest we've ever come to getting a game when it came out mm -hmm. in years. Um, let's see. All right. Anyway, um, your game is like your child. Hard to criticize it. Definitely need someone else. Yes, it does. Yes. Yes. Yes, peer review, which means another game developer, which is like what we do. Uh, people like Hawk and, and Drifty and Hard Reset in them. Um, and then uh, an actual tester, a tester who's a player and you look mm -hmm. at it from a player level. Yeah. So you want to get it both ways. You want to have criticism from another developer and you want to have criticism from players. Yes. That is the best way to handle it. SB says only if... <laughs> no! <laughs> SB, but it's true. I fucking hate it. Where can I get Hack and Play? Uh, it's a website. Google Hack and Play. I'll, uh, I'll put it up on the chat later. But yeah, yeah hack, um, and play. hack and play. That's what mm -hmm. we use. Um, I think it's free. It, once, you, once you go over a certain amount of uh, data, you have to start buying a, a subscription. But anyway, right. um, yeah, never dismiss a bug as a feature and don't rely on day one patches because they're horrible. Oh, gosh, please don't. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. Moving on. <laughs> All right. Gold. This is where it comes down to, guys. This is it. This is it. The gold stage. This is where you release the game to the general public. This is also called Going Gold. Although there is nothing inherently wrong with early access, we personally recommend against it without first having a solid plan. Do not add anything else to the game, DLC aside, once the game goes gold. Gold means that you are done, that you are not developing. You can, however, fix bugs and send out patches due to player feedback. You want to take feedback from this project to work on the next one. There comes a point where you just need to say, I'm done with this game and it's time to move on. Yes, SP, the actual term going gold is being pressed to disc. That's where it came from. However, with digital, digital content networks, it now means being released to the public. Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. In, in other words, the definition evolved as the industry evolved away from just pressing the disc. But you are correctly 100% correct do you know the reason it was called going gold i'll actually open that up to chat for a second while we talk about something else because going gold is called it that is called it that way for a reason now i will say this no not because money there is a there was a question earlier on i think it was by earl about what happens if you want to release extra content mm -hmm. what you want to do is once your main game is out and it's gone gold and it's been released then you start the entire process over for your DLCs, whether it be DLC 1, 2, 3, Continuing Adventure 1, 2, 3. This is not the same as an ongoing Games as a Service or MMO. That is way beyond the scope of this. 
because those games never really stop developing. They keep going Correct. until they get shut down. Mm -hmm. No, it's called going gold. <laughs> so, um, so whoever it was, I think it was Earl who asked the question about the DLC. After this game is released and you've got the bugs under control, then you start the process over for DLC 1. Then you wash, rinse, repeat. When that one goes gold and it's released, then you, you know, bugs are under control, then start DLC 2. And keep going until you're done with the DLCs and you're ready to move on to another project. Right. <coughs> the um, DLC mm -hmm. is just extra stuff, extra chapters to play through. Absolutely. Okay, it, it's... It's not. It's not part. It's not your main game. Right. If your it's game. It's not you continuing to develop your main game. It's not absolutely. that. Absolutely. Mm -mm. If your game is episodic, then it's the exact same thing would apply. You would create episode one like this, and then then start working on episode two. You can mix and match and start doing your pre-alpha while you're in beta for something else. You know, if you have that level of time on your hands. But we're talking about following a formula here. You want to. Get your first one out, then your second, then your third. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so no one's actually answered it. The reason is, is because back in the day, gold, the, 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 it was called Going Gold because the master disc for CDs and DVDs were colored gold. Yes, they were. They were gold. That's why it's called Going Gold, because you were pressing the master. And then you take the master, and once the master is pressed, um, or burnt actually, then you take it to the distribution center and they press out, stamp out, all the other DVDs. Yes, and they do. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called Going Gold. <laughs> it was thicker too. It was thicker too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we actually have a couple. I actually have a Master CD uh, DVD uh, in my storage area. It is um, something that I worked on back in the day. Yeah. But it's not like a. <laughs> I think I have a scratch on it. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've reached the end of our presentation, and this is where you can ask us any questions yep. uh, regarding any of the topics that we discussed yes. in this workshop. Yes. Uh, comments or provide additional info. Now's your chance. This is it. So uh, if you want to ask uh, anything related to this, go ahead and ask. So when is the world building stream again? All right, so what, we, what Teal and I have decided to do, and here's how we're going to handle it. Uh, starting tomorrow, our Patreons are going to have a poll put up, and they'll vote on the next Creator Classroom. World Building 4 is one of those in the rotation. Yeah. So, soon. At some time this month. But mm -hmm. the Patreons will be the ones actually voting on the one that's next week. It might be that one. Uh, is that to entice people to be Patreons? Yeah. But it's also because we want to give a little extra to the people who mm -hmm. are supporting us. To, but to answer your question, sometime this month, almost guarantee it. Yeah, because I think the world so. building mm -hmm. workshops are one of the absolute most popular things we do, Earl. Yeah, like super popular. Um, and anyone, anyone at any level, even the one dollar level, gets to take part in the voting. Uh, one rule of thumb: please, 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 if you're working on alpha beta, please back up your work. Yes, for one million. Oh yes, yes. times infinity. Oh. Yes, 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 yes. Graham's number, yes. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. all the yes. Mm -hmm. It is, do not. <laughs> do not. Yeah. So, um, We yeah. back up in two different places. Hello, yeah, No Man's Sky. I don't want, oof, oh, oof. Ugh. Yeah, you don't, you don't. And uh, make sure you have redundant backups, please. Yeah. Like, super yep. please. Mm -hmm. Like, have a local backup. Have a, um, a cloud backup. Um, have a, a backup on an external drive. Yeah. Please? Because uh, losing your shit is the... Losing your stuff L losing is... Losing all your hard work. Worst oh. thing in the world, man. There's nothing in the world that upsets me more than that. Yeah. Um, if you have an old DVD or CD writer, burn it. Because mm -hmm. you, you can't overwrite a CD or a DVD. No, you can't. You can't. It's permanent. And that's why you get the DVD R's and not the DVD, you know, RW's. So do I play games at any stage? Okay, so that's a good question. <laughs> um... We used to play games um, in any stage, starting alpha, um, and we we felt that our critiques weren't really ringing true to alpha games. So at this point, um, privately, we'll look at. I mean, it'll have to be an arrangement made, a late alpha mm -hmm. for in for it to be considered on stream. We it has to be a beta. It has to be in the beta phase simply because we there's not enough for us to work with in a public forum 
Um, that's the only reason. Do we review games that are gold? Um, we play games that are gold. And we critical play them. Yeah, we critical that, play the right. gold games. The mm -hmm. only time we made an exception was for Edge of Eternity, and that's because it was a short term while Teal was recovering from her surgery, and it overwhelmingly was voted on by my Patreons. Um, however, that game is technically in beta, and um, had problems that I, I believe they'll fix. But if it's going to be a critical play, which is our Wednesdays and Thursdays, it's got to be gold. If it's going to be a game you're developing, uh, we prefer it to be at least a beta for public. Um, if you want to approach us privately, we'll talk there for late alphas. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, USB sticks are cheap. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, they are. Oh, yeah. I always have a USB stick with some of my data backed up. Encrypted, too, by the way. Yay. Yes, encryption. Please encrypt. You don't have to use super encryption. Use, like, uh, what is it? Um, what's the one we use? It's not a... Uh, we used it back when we worked in the HIPAA stuff. Uh, BitLoader, BitCrypter, BitCrypter... BitLocker. BitLocker, yeah. Bit BitLocker. Locker. Get BitLocker. It's free. It comes with, like, a version of Windows. And put BitLocker and encrypt yes. your, your, your key drive. Um, or don't, but, I mean, encryption's important. But even more important is backup. Carbonite is your best friend. Mm -hmm. Carbonite, Carbonite is absolutely your best friend. Um, you know, we could. We, I don't think this would be a creator classroom, but at one point we should probably have as a addendum to one of our classrooms, mm -hmm. maybe about a 10, 20 minutes where we just go over various tools that we use. Mm -hmm. You know, Studio Blue's tool recommendations. Yeah, 15 minute tools. Yeah, just tools. You know, we recommend this tool here that, and, and show the links on screen. Ha 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 ha, cute. Any other questions? You guys are amazing as always, by the way. Um, we absolutely love doing this because you guys ask all the right questions and you all create such stimulating conversation. And when you all disagree with us, you make sure to vocalize it. And we Absolutely. either we either admit that we're wrong, admit that we screwed up like I did on the uh, slide earlier, or we clarify our point. So yeah, you yeah. know, you guys are Studio Blue audience is best audience. We believe that. Uh, yeah. Do you have any last minute thoughts on any of this on the game dev basic steel? Anything that you want to talk about? You good? I'm good. All right. So we'll just give it last time. Love your classes. Thank you, RPG Thanks. Emma. Thanks, Emma. Emma. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to continue doing these for as long as we can because this is fun. We love teaching you guys. Burn it down your office. All right. If it's not very practical. No, it's not. Not a very practical idea. Um, all right. So, yeah, if I don't get a question in the next few minutes, this was fun. First time. Yes, Earl. It was a pleasure meeting you on the other stream. Uh, we hope to see you more of you. Um, on Wednesdays, we do a critical play of Dragon Quest XI. Uh, a critical play is where we critically analyze a game while playing it. Right. And we're choosing games that are AAA industries. Yes. And games that we haven't played through before. So it's right. also a, a blind. quote unquote blind playthrough. We, well, for, for Shy Earl, you are very good. And it was a pleasure having you here. So thank you very much for being here thursdays we do the exact same thing it's our critical play but it's horizon zero dawn with me playing yeah and then fridays we have a ama chat stream where we just sit around for two hours ask us anything we'll talk about anything drink our adult beverages and just chill yeah hey steel do you still get your chicks mixed up with werewolves yeah sometimes it happens yeah yeah I, it's just it's it's the the feathers and the fur i can't get they both start with f and it confuses me <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> This has been a good classroom. Um, we we have to thank um, the viewers of our videos for this one. This one um, this one came because people who are watching our videos were asking to do one on. It started out as RPG creation, mm -hmm. uh, but as Teal and I looked at it, we were like, you know, we should probably really talk about um, just in general. Yeah, you know, just stuff in general. Um, because the, as we said at the beginning, this applies to any game making, regardless of your engine. Yeah, it really does. It really does. Um, some of these are just amazing. Now, I want to go ahead and give a specific shout out. Song of the Loot, you're the one who said on one of our videos that you would like to see the basics of an RPG. Teal and I made this classroom because of your request, and we thank you for it. We decided to go a little further than RPGs and talk about game development in general. But it's because of people like you asking us to do these things that Teal and I continue to make great content. Yes. 
So, Song of Loot, thank you. Big shout out. And to everyone else watching us, if you've given us ideas, especially on our classrooms, um, especially on our, our comment sections of our videos, mm -hmm. Teal and I will absolutely take into considerations. Um, last bit of questions here. Let's see. What's um, the best way to check if the game needs patching? If it has errors and bugs that are being reported by your players, you need to patch it. Yep. Yeah, once your game has gone gold and you have taken care of the big stupid bad bugs and you feel confident in releasing it gold, your players will let you know, hey, there's a problem here. Patch that. Yeah. Also, it might not be a bad idea to have people continue to QA your game after it goes gold just to make sure. Yeah, at least for a couple of months, right? Yeah. yeah. Basis of an RPG. Go on a quest, kill the monster, grab fat loot. What else do you need? I don't know. Some people like plot SB. I kind of like story. Yeah. Good characters. Also, Steel and Teal, do you have checked the Pokemon ver No, we... Oh, no, we don't. Sorry, man. Sorry. <laughs> You've asked us that twice, and we don't. <laughs> Chaos is going to get us, he man. going to get us. going to get, get us. Good. <laughs> oh, as always, you guys are absolutely stellar. Um, in the last minute, this will be the last question. One more question, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to go ahead and call it for the night. Um, because it's late for Teal and I. And it has been a heck of a day. Well, we, we really enjoyed having you guys uh, yes. on here. And I do enjoy giving these presentations. <laughs> so much so. It's, it's, for me, it's a lot of fun. And yeah. in some ways, when I'm doing the deep dive research, I'm reminded of things that I may have forgotten. Yeah. So it's really cool. It's I'm, very good. I, 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 it's like a refresher course for me, too. Mm-hmm. 100%. Same here, Teal. Same mm -hmm. here. All right, we're going to go ahead and call it for the evening. Um, <clears throat> as always, you guys have been amazing. Uh, you're very welcome, Emma. Uh, please stop by Wednesday for our critical play of Dragon Quest XI, where Teal is going to continue the quests of the Luminary to defeat Mordigan. Uh, Thursday is our critical play of Horizon Zero Dawn, where I blow up robots, robot mm -hmm. dinosaurs with a bow and arrow. That's amazing. Um, and, of course, Friday is our AMA, Ask Us Anything, where we drink, talk, and have a good time. So, if you like what you saw, leave the smack down the like button below, subscribe to our channel, consider supporting us on Patreon, connect with us over Facebook, Twitter, Discord, and we'll see you in the next video. See you next time.